we just give you praise this morning. By the way, thank you for all of you who uh, have been praying for my dad. He fell this last week and broke his other leg. And uh, he's in rehab right now. He's doing fine. He's just going to have to be patient, so pray for him. <laughs> if you know my dad. Uh, he's actually, this next week, he'll be 89 years old. And uh, he doesn't like laying around or sitting around much still. So just uh, keep him in prayer. But he's doing fine. He's just got to get to the point where he can get out of bed, you know, and move uh, a, a little bit before they're going to let him come home. But uh, we're thankful that the Lord watched over him, and it wasn't worse than it, it was. Amen. Amen. But, Father, we do praise you this morning. Thank you for this service. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you have for us today. Thank you for everyone that's here, those that are watching on the Internet right now. Uh, Lord, we just know that as we come together, your word tells us in Hebrews 12 that we are part of the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Some are in this building, some are at home watching on the internet, others may be on the other side of the world watching. But as we gather together today, we thank you that we meet with you before the throne and that you impart something to us that will glorify you through us on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll turn to somebody and greet them. Just tell them you love them. You're glad to see them in church. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Morning. Good morning. Love you guys. Good to see you. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. Happy birthday, Lady. All right. Grab your Bible this morning or your electronic device and turn over to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. Praise God. You know, in studying the Bible, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have the Lord have someone mentor me. Uh, Brother Kenneth E. Hagan, uh, he was, not only did I have a local pastor who mentored me, but God used Brother Hagan to mentor me in many, many years of experience in ministry. And uh, one of the things that I learned from him is when you're in a service, you need to find out what that service is about. Right. You know, I like, I like the fireworks of the Holy Ghost. How about you? Yeah. I like it when healing's flowing. I like it, you know, when the cloud comes in and people are falling out. I love that. That's wonderful. And we need that. But, you know, if you study Jesus' ministry, and he's really the example of all things for us. He did more teaching than he did anything. And I believe, I, I don't, I'm not saying I know every reason why he did that, but I believe one reason why is because he knew that the, the, the Spirit of God can minister to you and set you free, but even he himself taught that if you don't stay free, it'll be worse than it was before. Right. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. And how do you stay free? The Word of God. I know in my own life, my own experience. I've had experiences with God. I've had, you know, the, 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 I've had the holy laughter come on me. I've had the power of God hit me and knock me in the floor where I couldn't get up. I've had all of those things, you know, happen to me. And they've all blessed me and helped me and ministered to me. At times break depression off of me or, or whatever. Heal my body. One time Larry Huggins laid hands on me. And I literally, honest to God, thought I was going to float through the ceiling. That's how I felt. I felt like I was like, oh lighter than air. I'm gone, man. I'm having my own personal rapture right here, right now. But you know what I found? When I walked out the church door and went back to work or went back to my day, the devil was still out there. And, in, and a lot of times when I've had that some kind of experience or gotten a prophetic word from the Lord, he comes at me harder than he came at me before. And I couldn't call Brother Huggins and run back into the church building and float away again. Because those things are as the Spirit wills. You can't make the Holy Ghost do things. But what I could do was use the Word of God as a sword to defend myself. But if you don't know the Word, you don't know how to use a sword. 
You don't even know what the sword is. Yeah. It's not a book. It's not paper and ink. It's the rhemas of God. It's the speakings of God. It's the revelations of God that you know are true. Yeah. That you have to live out of that truth that you know inside in spite of the circumstantial evidence of the devil manipulating the natural realm to try to convince you that that's what truth is instead of what you know is truth. Yes. Amen? Yes. So I believe the Lord did a lot of teaching because he knew that if people aren't taught, even if I do heal them, even if I do minister, even if I cast the devils out of them, they're going to end up back in, a, in the same mess unless they know how to defend themselves and how to stand and walk in victory. Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So uh, we need teaching. Now, I know the Lord's restoring a lot of other things in the body right now. And when, that's, when you're in a season like that, a lot of that stuff goes on. And that's good. And we need it. I embrace it. I'm for it. But we can't leave the other things. Jesus said we're to worship him in spirit. That's all the fireworks. And in truth, Jesus said thy word is truth. So feed on the word every day. Spend time before the Father with his word. Let him teach you. I, I have a, the way my life works is I usually wake up in the middle of the night. And when I get up, I can't go back to sleep, even if I try, for an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. That's just me. So I get up, I go in the living room, I sit before the Lord and begin to worship him. And this morning, what I'm getting ready to share with you, he gave to me. This morning out of Psalm 111. So what was that? That was me before the Lord with the word and letting him feed me or build in me his word. Hallelujah. And when I go out into that world and every contradictory thing in the natural realm is being manipulated to tell me the opposite of what the word says, I know how to stand my ground because I know what the word says. And when the devil tries to stick me with his sword of the spirit out of his lying mouth, I stick him back with the sword of the spirit that comes out of Jesus' mouth. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. So, so spend time with the Father. Spend time in the word. Don't give me this business you don't have time. You'll have time to be defeated. You'll have time to be demonized. You'll have time to lay in a sick bed. You'll have time to sit in the lawyer's office. You'll have time to have the devil kick you around like a soccer ball. What it boils down to is it's priority. People don't want to or they don't understand many times. They need to grow. Amen? We've got to grow. And I can't make you grow. I can't do it for you. I have a certain role in your life that I play. You have a certain role in my life that you play. But I have to get with Jesus. He's not going to let you have a relationship with him through me or any of your a favorite prophet or evangelist or apostle or whatever. Thank God for all those ministries and all they're anointed to do. We embrace and receive that. But it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. When Adam and Eve quit walking with him one-on-one, -on -one, that's when they got in trouble. I didn't plan on saying that, but I'm not taking it back. Psalm, Psalm 111. Now, we're in a time where the Lord is, Karen, what Karen said earlier is true. We're, we're moving into kingdom age, the thousand-year reign of Jesus. We're, I'm not saying we're there yet, but we're moving toward that quickly. I believe we're quickly moving toward that. Is it going to happen while I'm alive? I don't know, and no, neither does anybody else, so don't let them tell you they do. Amen. We don't know the day or hour. We do know time and season. And we're in that season. We're in that Kairos moment where God is beginning to emphasize certain things. The, the thousand year reign is where Jesus is going to come back to earth and he is going to do a hostile takeover. Yes. Not everybody's going to be glad to see him show up. You read the prophets, you find that during that time, that the, the nations will be required to come up to Jerusalem where he's ru ruling as king to worship him, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. But when they refuse to do that, nations refuse to do that, they won't get any rain that year. So it's not going to be this like ideal, everybody's going to be hugging each other, you know, we are one and all that stuff. There will be a powerful church. There will be a powerful uh, group of people that are ruling and reigning with him. But during that time, he is going to rule and he's going to reign in Jerusalem. Now, the, the atmosphere around his throne and in his people will be a heavenly environment or atmosphere. 
the tangibility of the glory and the spirit of God. Amen. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy will be done, Father. And then he told us what his will was. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. It's God's will. He started this thing with the environment of heaven, the glory of heaven, on earth in everything. And when Adam and Eve sinned, that, that glory was departed. All, it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory. glory of God. In Psalm 8, it says, God created man, surrounded, crowned with glory and honor. The presence of God. And that was lost in the garden. It's going to be restored. And so God is teaching us to come back into that. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, taught his disciples, you need to pray that right now in your life, it be, the will of the Father be, that it be on heaven as it is on earth. You can have, see, that's what Jesus had on him and around him and in him was the atmosphere of heaven. The heavens were open over him. The angels were ascending and descending. Yeah, well, that was Jesus. Well, what about Jacob? Jacob was uh, kind of like you and me. He knew how to shuck and jive and manipulate a little bit, you know, and kind of make, try to make it happen on his own. Now, I know none of you in here would ever do that, but none of us have ever tried that, right? But yet, yeah, he inherited the Abrahamic blessing from his father, laid down and went to sleep that night, and had a dream and saw that because of that blessing, because of that covenant inheritance, the angels were ascending and descending over him. Yes. And the same angels are ascending and descending over you. Yes. But it's whether you let them operate around you. Because they only operate in a heavenly atmosphere. Amen. Demons operate in a hell atmosphere. Amen. Amen. We're told in James 3, it says that when there's strife, when you, when you get into, well, let's just turn over there and look at it. You can hold your finger right here at Psalm 111, can't you? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm already getting something out of this. Even if you have to say it by faith, just go ahead and say it, amen? By the way, you can smile in this church. You can laugh. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is, not going, to be, is going to be like. It's not going to be, oh, all the time. Come on. I thought, the throne room is going to be awesome. Yeah. Beyond what we understand. But heaven's going to be a happy place. So why don't you go ahead and get happy while you're down here. And what are you putting it off for? Now look what it says here in James 3.13. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Endued with knowledge. Walking in the wisdom of God. Let him show out of a good lifestyle, is what that word means. His, in other words, the way he lives. His works and meekness of wisdom. Notice the wisdom is in meekness. Not in pride. Not in I've got it figured out. Not in nobody can correct me. Not in I'm offended, you need to apologize to me. Apology is not in the Bible. Jesus never required an apology of anybody, and if anybody ever deserved an apology, it was Jesus. You're full of pride if you're holding this thing of, you need to apologize to me. Well, I'm glad you finally apologized to me. It's you that's wrong. Even if they did something wrong, it's you. You're holding them in unforgiveness, and you're full of pride, and you need to repent and get humble and get meek before God so he can show you that you're operating like a Pharisee and get out of that. Quit walking around in offense and eventually growing a root of bitterness and polluting the in spiritual environment around you everywhere you go. Yeah. You ever been around somebody that, had, that has a root of bitterness in them? Yeah. Man, they're producing fruit. Yeah. I had a relative that I love with all my heart. She's not on this earth anymore. But she had bitterness in her. And I could only stand to be around her for about an hour at a time. Yeah. I loved her. Still love her. She, she was born again. I know she's in heaven. She was having visions of heaven while she was dying of cancer. But I, I couldn't stand to be around her very long. Because she just was constantly filling the air full of things that were offensive. And gossiping about everybody else in the family and telling everything that they were doing wrong. And I knew as soon as I left, I was going to be the next subject. Come on, are you here? Now, see, a person like that, a person like that, what's, what, they are aligned demonically, even though they're a, a child of God. 
their mind is aligned, their soul is aligned demonically, they've got a root of bitterness in them, and the devil is using them to spread, didn't finish reading it here, verse 14, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, basically he's saying just shut your big mouth. Nobody will know you're a fool if you don't open your mouth and tell them. Verse 15, that's, I'm just putting it out there where we can all understand it, amen? Verse 15, this wisdom, what wisdom? This bad wisdom, wrong wisdom. See, there's a demonic wisdom and there's a godly wisdom. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion. God is not the God of, the Bible says, and every evil work. Are you here? See, you can be born again, have the Spirit of God in you, the life of God in you, but if you let the devil deceive you to not walk in love, yeah. to not walk in selfless love, right. why does Jesus tell us to forgive those that have offended us? Why does he tell us to pray for those that are despitefully using us? Because he knows that if we don't, we will be deceived into a place where we are be being trafficked by the devil and he's using us to release demonic things into the earth and we become a part of the problem and not a part of the answer. Yeah. And usually begin to justify ourselves. Right. And nobody can correct you. Anytime anybody even thinks about correcting you, you usually blow up like dynamite. Or you get mad and go to the next church out of the 26 you've been to before. I'm getting real this morning. I'm not throwing rocks at people. I'm getting real about being free from the enemy. See, I'm not telling you anything I didn't have to deal with in my life. All those years when I was pointing my finger at my wife and pointing my finger at other people and talking about preachers being hypocrites and, and all of this kind of stuff. I remember, you know, I, was, I fished in the bass club down in Fresno, and we had our bass tournaments usually on Sunday. And so I'd go out, you know, and be fishing. People asked Karen where I was at, and she'd say, he's out in his $3,000 pew, you know, on the lake. <laughs> and I'd say stupid stuff like, I can worship God more out here looking at nature than I can down there in that church with all those hypocrites. What I didn't realize is I was the biggest hypocrite of all. Because at least they were at church trying not to be a hypocrite. I was out there being a full-blown hypocrite and didn't care. But see, I was deceived. I, I actually thought that was truth. You start making excuses when God calls you on the carpet. Whether he calls you on the carpet through his word one-on-one -on -one, or he puts you under somebody, God's always going to put you under somebody in authority and they are going to be used to correct you and if you don't submit to it, you are not submitted to God. Now, if somebody tries to tell you something's not scriptural or they try to control your life in every area or something like that, of course that's wrong. You don't submit to that. But God, if you can't submit to somebody in the body, don't fool yourself. You will never submit to God. See, if the disciples wouldn't submit to Jesus... He couldn't have let them, he couldn't have given to them all that they needed so they could go and walk and be submitted to God as an apostle. Right. You've got to be a disciple before you can even get close to what God's called you to do. Come on, come on, come on. Well, you know, over the years, like Karen said, we've been doing this over 30 years, I hear people, people come to me and, that, you know, I'm coming to this church. Now, not everybody that comes here does this. There are people that God leads here from another church. He told me, first thing he told me, when I gave my life to him and got serious with him, is he told me to change churches. I argued with him for three months. Because my mind, I didn't make sense in my mind. He had to finally get me to a place where I understood and saw why he wanted me to do that. Yeah. At least partially why. <laughs> Figured the rest of it out when I obeyed him. But I've had people over the years come in here, and you know, they'll change churches, come here, and the first thing they do is start talking about the pastor they left. Well, he wasn't doing this, and he should have done that, and they did this, and that, that, that. And I know right away, maybe the pastor was off in some areas. Maybe he did make some mistakes. Maybe he did do some things in the flesh. But you have a problem, my friend. And usually, 99 times out of 100, eventually, they get mad at me or somebody around here. They leave this church, and they go to another church and start talking about me. 
Because that's how you're going to live until you get honest with yourself. I didn't know how messed up I was. I just knew that I wasn't submitted to and yielding to the Lord and allowing Him to tell me anything He wanted to. I was at least had enough understanding to see that my life wasn't going the right direction. It was my marriage and other things were going the wrong direction. The symptoms of the disease, the spiritual disease I had was slapping me in the face every day. But oh, I had an answer for that. It's their fault. But when I got on my face, and I, well, I wasn't on my face. I'd hit the steering wheel if I'd have tried to do it. But I bowed my heart before the Lord and said, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I, I don't know what to do. I don't even know how to do this. I give you my life. I said this to him, 110% if that's possible. And whatever you show me to do or you tell me, I'll believe it. Even if I don't fully understand it, as long as I know it's you, I'm going to believe it. And that was the start of me coming out of darkness. Coming into light. And right now, in the church, in the world, in our nation, there's a lot of people that are living that way. I didn't plan on preaching any of this. This wasn't what he told me at 3 o'clock in the morning. But you see, it's, I'm, I'm telling you, I know this, that we are at a time right now where people are going to make a decision to go into great revelatory light and blessing and glory and all that God has said, or they're going to go into darkness where they'll actually think up is down and down is up. God's good. He's going to visit people. All the people you've been praying for, He is going to visit them. If He has to come in their bedroom at night and appear to them, if He has to appear to them in a dream, if he has to send an angel, whatever he's going to, he's, he's going to answer your prayers. He's not going, he, see that's what happened to me in that work truck. My wife was praying for me, my mom was praying for me, my mother-in-law, she was sneaking up on me. She'd come out there, my truck was parked behind her house. She'd get out there before I got there in the morning, lay hands on my truck and start praying in tongues. She was sicking the Holy Ghost on me every day. And I'd come tootling up there, you know, in my car, you know, listen to the to Peter Frampton or something. Da, 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 da. Anybody remember him? There's a few of us old folks in here. Today. I'd get out of that car just as happy as a, you know, goose on a lake or whatever. Get up in that truck, shut the door, and it was like, uh-oh. What happened? Where did all that joy go? How come I'm feeling so convicted all of a sudden? There's probably an angel sitting over in the shotgun seat. Been waiting for you to get here. <laughs> Come on, are you here? This is real stuff I'm talking about. And it was in that truck that I, I made things right with God. Thank God you did. Yes. Amen. I agree. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> thank God. Hallelujah. Well, all right, Lord, you messed my message up. What do we do now? Keep on doing what I'm doing. But these scriptures right here. This is, this is what lays it right out there. You know, there's, there's some scriptures in the Bible that just kind of cut right to the chase and divide truth and, and darkness, truth and, and lie. One of them is John 10.10. 10. The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That is a line drawn in the sand. That is a line of demarcation. You don't mix those up. I hear people doing that all the time. Some of the music on, on the Christian radio. There's one song. If you don't move the mountain that I wanted you to move. What do you mean he don't move the mountain? Maybe that's some mountain you didn't want to move, but you should find out what mountain you needed to move before you went to him and asked him to move it. Don't, call, don't say God's a liar. I, I, the mountain will move. And then, well, no, I shouldn't have said that, I guess. So I'm not going to move this one for you. The problem is we're not finding out what we need to do. We need relationships so we'll know what to do, and then he'll, and we walk with him, it'll get done. We build doctrines out of what we don't know. 
We build doctrines out of ignorance. We build doctrines out of experience, as if experience in the natural realm, a sin-filled world where demons operate, angels operate, and we, we, you know, we see something happen, and we, we come to this conclusion that, well, that person was a Christian, and they asked God to help, and it, he didn't help, and so it must mean he doesn't help all the time. That's a lie from hell. We need to line up with him, not him line up with us. Look at your neighbor and say, you know, Pastor John really does love us. He really does. He really does. I do. I really do love you. If I didn't, I wouldn't tell you the truth. I come up here and, you know, preach some little soft, toasty, let's all pat each other on the back and go home and continue in our misery. But I want to get out of the misery. I want to walk in the freedom. I want to walk in the light. I want to walk in the life. Now, I'm not saying beat yourself up and, oh, for everything you did. I'm not talking about that. If you've received Jesus and his blood's going to work in you, you are free. But you have to walk with him in his ways. Amen? Psalm 111. I think uh, Joanne got it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Psalm 111, the word works or work is mentioned five times. Everybody say five. Five is the number of redemption or of grace, I should say. Five is the number of grace. Everybody say grace. What is grace? Grace is God's attitude toward us that motivates him to have mercy on us. God is for you. Remember Romans 8, Paul said, he, he went through all that talking about creation, groaning, and the law of the spirit of life set us free from the laws of sin and death. In chapter 7, the things I should do, I don't do. He went through that whole human condition of walking on earth. And then he said at the, the conclusion of it, if God's for us, who can be against us? In other words, all this humanity stuff and me as a human making mistakes and missing God and all this and the condition of the earth groaning and travailing and the whole thing, he said, God's for me. Amen. God is for you. Amen. God loves you. Amen. He really does. Yes. He really does. Yes. He really loves you. Yes. He really does. Yes. He does. Yes. He does. He really does. There ain't no but in it either. He loves me but. No. Sheep follow goat's butt. Don't be a goat. Follow the shepherd. He loves you. Now, he, the Bible says that we as parents are to raise our children in that love. And it, he breaks it down. He says, here's how you do it. Nurture and admonition. Nurturing is encouragement, loving them, giving them mercy, you know, helping them, praying for them, being a good parent to them in that way. Admonition means that you instruct them, child train them. Sometimes you go to them and say, you are being lazy. That is not a good characteristic to develop. Because if you're lazy in other things rather than picking up your room, and when you grow up, you're going to lose your job because you're lazy. You're going to go through pain. You're going to go through problems. You're going to go through sorrow. You may even go through depression because you're lazy. See, in our day and age, people think love, you know, they, they call, if, if you tell somebody a truth they don't want to hear because you love them, you're a hater. Haters. Don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I don't know your heart, but I can see the fruit on the tree. If you're over here doing something that I know is going to cause damage in your life and in others, I can tell you about it because I love you to warn you from the problems it's going to take you into. Because the devil's, instruct, the devil's uh, way of dealing with you is never to stop at one little violation. It's always to plant the seed to grow into a place where 
killing, stealing, and destroying happens as a result of it. So love is a balanced thing. When God tells me, John, you're in pride. Oh, God told me I'm in pride. He doesn't love me. No. I know I'm being ridiculous, but it helps get the point across. Now, when I was, a, when I was immature spiritually, if even a person or someone said that to me, I got offended. I got my feelings hurt. But I've learned that if God comes to me, it's like driving down 99 a few years ago, and I'm asking him if I should be even going to this church over here preaching anymore, because I knew he set it up, but it just didn't seem, to, in my mind, it didn't seem like it was what it was supposed to be. And he says, you don't even understand your own ministry. Been preaching 30 years, but you don't understand your own ministry. The first thing I thought, I almost ran off the freeway, man, when he said, first thing I thought was, What? I've been preaching for 30 years and don't understand my own man. He said, no, I'm not saying you haven't understood things that I've had you doing in the past. But right now where you're at, you don't understand how I want to use you. Right. See, your ministry is progressive just like everything else in your life should be. And then he explained it to me. But if I had had a wrong mindset and he said that to me, I would have go, oh, I knew I'd miss God. I know he like me. I know I'm just a failure. I know that I... See, the Lord wants us to understand He loves us. And because He loves us, he's, He doesn't put up boundaries in our life to put us in a jail cell. He, puts us, he gives us boundaries to keep us from going out where the devil's going to destroy us. God gave the, the children of Israel the seven redemptive cycle calendar year. And they had, they had to go, and, or they had to, to honor him in those seven redemptive feasts. There were four in the, in the spring. There were three in the fall. And as they did that, not just doing something, but from their heart, understanding why they were doing that feast and what their heart was supposed to be toward God and be renewed in the understanding of what he'd done for them and was doing for them, then he was able to keep their heart in a place where they we're in a circle of protection all year round. It was like a walled city or something around them. But it was only when they said, you know what, we really don't have to do this feast this year. You know, we're doing pretty good. We're rich. We're blessed. We got all the animals we need. Da 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 da. -da. We can just let that slide. Thanks, God, but we got it from here. The next thing you know, they're not just not doing the feasts. They're over into idol worship, sexual perversion, worshiping Baal. See, you have been created to worship. You will worship whether you want to or not. Right now in your life, you are worshiping someone. Because the word worship doesn't just mean, I love you, Jesus, I worship you. That may be a way of expressing worship. But worship is what you're submitting to and laying your life down for. The biggest idol you'll have trouble with is not the devil, it's you. You'll want to do what you want to do instead of what he wants you to do. Even though his way is going to lead to life and blessing and your way is going to lead to destruction. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Failure, death, destruction. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor John loves us. I know he does. I believe it. I'm having to believe it by faith right now, but I know he loves us. Hallelujah. But see, when you finally take you out of the throne, and you sit down over here next to Jesus in the throne of your life, and you look at him and you listen to him and you let him run the show by the Holy Spirit. That's when he is going to begin to rule and reign. And he knows things you don't know. He can do things you can't do. And he can keep the devil out of your life when you can't. The Lord one day was correcting me. I was driving down Yosemite Avenue. And he said, John, don't fool yourself. He said, whatever part of you I'm not Lord of, the devil is, not you. You're not smart enough to outfox him. 
He's been working for thousands of years dealing and manipulating human beings. So if you don't lay it on the altar, give it to me and open up to me and let me run the show, let me be the king in that area, the enemy will be the king without you even knowing until you wake up one day and he's right there going, ha! Gotcha. <laughs> Dear Jesus, why do I even turn to the scripture reading in the morning? Did I tell you that in Psalm 111, the work word works is mentioned five times? And really, it ties into what we're talking about. Because what this psalm is about, it's, you know, anointed by the Spirit to commemorate. Everybody say commemorate. commemorate. To think back to what God did for them in Egypt. Took them from being slaves, gave them all of the wealth of Egypt, restored to them. How many of you know the scripture? A lot of, a lot of Christians like to quote this one nowadays. If a thief be found, he must return sevenfold. Anybody ever heard that one? Me and two other people? Hallelujah. You guys are really reading your Bible, huh? Praise God. Sevenfold. Why sevenfold? Why not tenfold? Because the number seven, if you understand the number seven in the Bible, it's the number of perfect completion. What he's saying there is, and he's saying to us, is that when we reconnect with our spiritual heritage, anything the devil has ripped you off of, whether it's money or it's wisdom or it's peace or whatever it is, you name it, the devil has to return the fullness of what he took from you. If your grandma lost something that belonged, should have belonged to you in this day and hour, you, if you follow God and you make a demand on it, God will force the devil to give you back not just a portion of that, but the fullness of what you should have in this day and hour. When he delivered them out of Egypt, he gave them all of the wealth of Egypt. You know why? They built Egypt. Study your Bible. Study history. It was the Hebrews that went in there with the blessing of Abraham on them, and as they multiplied, and then that one Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph was raised up in power, and he began to oppress them and enslave them, they were used to build Egypt in all of its glory and grandeur and bring it into a place of being the most powerful nation on the earth. So that wealth of Egypt wasn't Egypt's, it was theirs. Back wages, honey. And God says, I'm taking you out of here and I'm giving you the fullness of what belongs. Some of you need to take a hold of the fullness. The fullness. My wife, one of her relatives, owned a bunch of land in, in Oklahoma that they found oil on. And he lost it before they found oil on it in a card game. That's my oil. Because I'm married to her. It's our oil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, not maybe the piece of land itself, but what should have been in her family lineage. People still never wrap their head around this in the body of Christ. They're so afraid of money. <gasps> oh, my God. Prosperity doctrine, prosperity doctrine. Name it and claim it, name it and claim it. <laughs> you know, the Jews don't have any problem with being rich. Yeah. Kenneth Hagin, the man I was talking about earlier, he had an appearance of Jesus in his life, a vision of Jesus. And the Lord told him, he says, if you'll walk with me and listen to me, I'll make you wealthy. He said, I'm not opposed to my people being wealthy. I'm opposed to them being covetous. Amen. You know, some people would backslide over a thousand bucks. Because they're covetous. They got money as set up in their heart as, a, as an idol. If you won't tithe... <laughs> There again, that's one of those things where we're playing games in our own mind. Well, I believe that's Old Testament. Read the Bible before you say things like that. Don't go get on the Internet and listen to some guy that's trying to figure out a way to keep all the money he's got. That's right, twist things around. Jesus is our high priest, it says in Hebrews, and it says there he receives the tithe. Has he stopped being high priest? Is he still in heaven making intercession for us? Then he must be still receiving the tithe to those that are giving it to him. 
Didn't plan on saying that today, but I'm not taking it back either. So if God can't deal with you about, in your heart about money, you'll never have your inheritance. He can't trust you with it. You'll end up killing yourself with it somehow or spending it on something where the enemy will deceive you into using it for his purposes. Don't shut me down because I'm preaching real good. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, Pastor Purcell loves us. Hallelujah. Ten minutes after 11 already. Glory to God. So this Psalm 111, <laughs> it's about the works that God did in Egypt. Now, we have to translate that into the New Testament. That whole thing, all the stories in the Old Testament, all of the, the things that were there, they were all like parables and types and shadows of a New Testament spiritual truth. You know, I love the Hebrew roots movement that's happening right now. I love it that we're discovering our Hebrew roots because it helps us understand the Bible. The Bible's written from that Jewish perspective. If you don't understand the roots, you won't understand the fruit. Amen. But let me say this. Here's the, the, the problem I see with it. Some people are trying to make the root the fruit. Right. We're the fruit, not the root. Right. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Those things in the Old Testament, those things that Abraham did and Moses with the law and all of those principles and all those stories, that was God working with unborn again people who did not have the life and nature of God in them. He would anoint them and empower them to do certain things, to establish things in a certain way, to plant a seed of faith that would grow up eventually and Jesus became the manifestation of that seed. He was called the seed of Abraham. And then he produced the fruit of eternal life and said, now you can have this. You can move into, you don't have to be a seed. You don't have to be a root. You don't have to be the trunk. Now you're a limb off of me. I'm the living tree, the tree of life. And now I want you to stay connected to me and you will produce the fruit that comes out of the root. See, some people are teaching, oh, no, 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 you've got to have a prayer shawl before you pray. Oh, you've got to be able to, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. No, you don't. Those are all prophetic things that were done that needed to be done during that time. But in our time, we understand the prophetic understanding of it. And so we walk in the spirit in the, the fulfilled truth of the fruit. We don't go back and try to be the root. Now, if you want to celebrate Jewish holidays, I don't have a problem with that. Go ahead. It's great. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't condemn me if I don't. Cause, see, we're in kind of in danger of what happened in the early church and the first generation church when they begin to walk in the freedom of what I'm talking about here in the New Covenant and all of a sudden the Judaizers came in and said, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. you've got to be circumcised if you're going to go to heaven. Yeah. You've got to go back under the law and be circumcised or you're not going to go to heaven. And Paul, he didn't warn us so much about crazy radical demons. He warned us about what he called another gospel. See, the, the devil knows people like you that are sincere about following God. He's not going to come down here and, you know, hand you a bag of marijuana, you know, try to get you to play the Ouija board probably. That's not going to work with you. Right? At least, dear God, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> what he's going to do is he's, he's going to see you going down the, the pathway of God, and he's going to say, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's just add this onto that so that you, boop, you just shift off a little. And then you keep going, and God keeps going this way, and you're going this way. So we have to watch that. We have to be careful of that. Oh, Lord, I, I've gotten off on a rabbit trail. I can't. Like I said, I don't mind going on rabbit trails as long as we catch the rabbit. But I don't think I can even catch this rabbit now. I don't have time. So let's go back to Psalm 111. Let me read it. Maybe that'll help. Verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Sincerely, in the assembly of the upright, 
Amen. That's us. And in the congregation. Why? Verse 2. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. The work, his work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Another word for compassion is covenant kindness. People have painted God to be something he's not even. He hath, made, he hath given meat unto them that fear him. He took care of the children of Israel all those years, didn't he? He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He'll never forget that covenant commitment he's made to you. And what is a covenant commitment he's made? He's committed himself to give you all he is and all he has to be there for you. He's sold out committed. He hath shown his people the power of his works, that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of his hands are verity. That word verity means trustworthy or true. He's trustworthy. He's true. And judgment. He's a king. He makes judgments. He establishes it as a law or a precept or a principle. All his commandments are sure. And don't just think of the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He was talking about in the context of a fellowship and relationship. When the Lord speaks to my heart and tells me to start doing something or stop doing something or even study something or whatever it might be, he's not saying, uh, John, excuse me, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, would you mind studying that over there for a while? He's my king. I take his word as a commandment, yeah. not a suggestion. I'm not the king. Right. You're not the king. Right. He says, if you'll keep my commandments, then he talked about all the good things that would happen when we do that. See, you're never, listen to this now. You might want to even write this down. You will never be able to receive the word as a promise until you receive it as a commandment. Now, why is that true? Because if you receive it as a, if your heart is such that you're before the king submitted to him and he says something to you and you say, that's the king talking, I, I, I don't have a choice here. Uh, he's, he's, he's for me. He loves me. He's gracious. He's kind. I don't have to have a choice. Matter of fact, I don't even want to have a choice because he understands it better than I do. Right. And I take that and this is, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm living. I'm going to do that. Once you step into that position, you have stepped into humility. You have humbled yourself under the mighty hand of, of God, the king. And now, through that, whatever he said to you and you doing that, you're going to be exalted in due season. That word is going to go from being a, just him saying something for you to do to becoming a promise, a rhema word that fills you with promise that causes you to say, you know what, this is what God's saying I can have and that's for me. It may even be down the road of peace or whatever, but this now, now I can walk in the revelation of this. See, this is why many Christians' faith don't work. They hear somebody preach some principles that they can put together in their mind. Well, you've got to have faith, and if you have faith, da 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 And they, they hear it up here. But because their heart is not submitted to him, they can't receive it as rhema to where it goes from being a commandment and a principle to a promise, to life, to a spoken word of God, a creative word of God that becomes part of them. Then they have, now you have faith. Faith comes by hearing the rhema, the speakings of God. And if your heart's not in that place, you'll sit here and listen to me talk, and you may say, well, that sounds right, or, well, I don't know if I agree with that. Or, or what. And then you'll walk out of here and try to work the principles, and you'll fail. Because he's not a head God, he's a heart God. I hope that's clearer than mud. Hallelujah. Praise God. What verse was I on? Seven? For the works of his hands are verity, judgment, oh yeah, and co the commandments are sure. That word sure means reliable or firm. When he tells you to do something, he's doing it because he loves you, it's for you, it's going to produce his kingdom in you and through you, and I don't care how many demons get upset, I don't care if they have a, a meeting in hell about you tomorrow and plan your demise, they will fail every time if you stay with God and his word and his commandment because you have his promise, you have his voice on it, and his reputation's on the line, and the Bible says that he'll elevate his word even above his own name. 
I asked the Lord about that one day. I read that in Psalm, what is it, Psalm 119, I think it is, where it says, I elevate my word above my name. I go, God, I don't understand that. What are you talking about, your word above your name? He says, sometimes in me keeping my word, it, because people don't understand, it gives me a bad name. But he said, I'm going to keep my word even if I get a bad name. Amen. We need to be the same way. Verse 8. They, these commandments, these works, they stand fast forever. Hallelujah. And ever. And are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. Say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. See, Pharaoh is a type and shadow of the devil. His kingdom was Egypt. The people of God were in bondage under him. Jesus came, or the, 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 the Father came in with the blood of the Lamb, type and shadow of Jesus Christ. When the blood was applied to their household, they were redeemed from slavery, from being the devil's slave. We became redeemed. We became bought back from that slavery that, uh, that Adam sold us into in sin. We became born again, born from above. So we left the kingdom of the devil. Yeah. Amen? We left that kingdom of the enemy. He's redeemed us. He's, he's bought us back. He's brought us out, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He sent redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Amen. Why does God demand? You know, I used to think, Lord, why do you make it so hard on me? Anybody ever whine about that? Yeah. How come you make me believe stuff that doesn't even seem real. Why do you make me call things which be not as though they were? Because of what it just said right here. Let's read it again. He says he has commanded his covenant forever. When God says something to you, he doesn't just, there again, it's not a suggestion, it's not a, some kind of frivolous human thing. He's saying it in covenant. He's committing himself to this. He's saying, when he said to Abraham, Abram, you, your name is changing right here, which means in, to, in his culture, he understood, if he changes my name, he changes who I am and what I'll do, what I'll be and what I'll do. He's changing my character, my nature. Because see, you think you know who you are, but you really don't. He has to name you. And he won't tell you who you are until you can understand it. Some people, Christians, they're born again. They're babes of Christ in, in the body. They live their whole life and never know who they are. Never know why they were even here. Come on, are you here? He said, Abram, which meant, you know, it was kind of a, a in the Hebrew it means like you're a big shot in, in, the, in the territory, in the, yeah, you're, you're a, you know, you're a well thought of person in society. He said, no, that's, that's good, but that's not who you really are. That's not your purpose, just to be elected mayor. You know, you are Abraham, father of a multitude. Now, he told him that when he couldn't produce kids and his wife couldn't produce kids. And it says Abraham believed him and God accounted it unto him for righteousness. See, I used to say, God, why, why do you make us live that way? I thought he was like, you know, testing me, which in a way he is, I guess, in some ways. But what he's doing is he's allowing us to live in a realm the devil can't get into. Amen. When God says something to you in covenant and in his kingdom, he has released something to you that's protected by that covenant and the blood, the angels of heaven, everything that's in God's kingdom. That seed word is in your heart, and he's giving that to you. And, what he's, and if we understood it, we would rejoice over it, even though it looked crazy what he said to us, or everything in life looked the opposite, because he's given us a protected seed that he's going to water with his word, that he's going to bring forth and grow into harvest and manifest in your life, and the devil can't do nothing but have a hissy fit about it. The devil will persecute you over it. He'll lie to you. He'll attack you. He'll try to get at you. But he cannot get to that promise and that seed and make it not happen. So he was giving me the, the blessing of living by faith. Not the torment you by living by faith. I thought it was. Are you here? Praise God. 
Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I've preached myself happy. I'm going to close here. The pilot has come on. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. Fasten your seat belt. We will be landing at Fresno Air Terminal in about 30 minutes. Hallelujah. <laughs> No, we're going to try to end it a little faster than that. Praise God. I wish I would have had the opportunity to teach this song. Because every one of these works is just powerful. His works are great, verse 2. Honorable and glorious. To be remembered. Hallelujah. And then <clears throat> he, his works... Is what has made available to you the heritage of the heathen. Yes. Anything the devil has that's yours, they have, he has to give it back. Right. Seven fold. Fullness. Fullness. And his works, you can count on his works. They're trustworthy. It's a judgment from heaven, from the king of all creation. They're reliable and they're firm. Now let's, let's finish it by going to... Uh, Verse 9 here, let's read this. He sent redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Now the word reverend here, it means, it's a word that talks about having a fear, but it's a positive fear. There's another word similar to it that means negative fear. This is a positive fear. It's a I wrote down the definition. It's a positive feeling of awe. And if I'd have had the time to teach all these different things in here and what the words around them mean, basically what it boils down to is God is doing things that are beyond our comprehension, beyond our ability to do them, and they're done out of nothing but a heart of mercy and love. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory which produ should produce in us a reverent, a positive feeling of awe, causing one to tremble in amazement at him and his works. Glory to God. The scripture he's had me standing on for about two or three years now is, I'm doing exceeding abundantly beyond what you can ask or even think. Put yourself in my hands. Amen. But then verse 10, the fear of the Lord. Now that's what he's talking about here, that verse he, he, he mentioned before about having that awe, that positive fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Everybody say the beginning of wisdom. How many of you want to be wise? Brook of Proverbs says, man, whatever you do, get wisdom. Seek wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Amen. We want, to, we want to be wise. We don't want to think we're wise and not be wise. We want to be wise. Yeah. Well, it says, here's how you start. You step into what we're talking about here in that reverential awe of God, that he is God. And he's done things for you you don't even know he's done. He's doing things for you you don't even know he's doing. He's got things, he's going to accomplish things that you can't accomplish. Amen? Amen? And things that you'll, I, th I really believe that we're going to spend eternity understanding what he's done. I may be wrong on that. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that what? Do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Beginning of this year, the Lord told us prophetically that this was to be a year of praise. It was a Psalm 117 year. Psalm 117 is two verses, and basically it says to just acknowledge who God is, what we're talking about here, how awesome He is, and who He is, and to praise Him and extol Him and magnify Him. And as I sought the Lord about that, well, Lord, why is, is it this year that He says, because what I'm going to be doing in you and in the church and in the earth it's too beyond your understanding and comprehension. 
And if you get caught up in the process of what's happening in the natural realm or even in the spirit realm, you're going to start believing and saying things that's going to hinder me in the process I want to do in your life. Did you know Jesus was about the Father's business, not everybody else's business? We need to just, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs, it says a man who sticks his nose, is, I don't, that's not the exact uh, scriptural <laughs> wording, that's the Pastor Purcell paraphrased edition. A man who butts in or sticks his nose into another man's business is like a man who takes a dog by the ears. You grab some dog and snatch him up by the ears, especially if he's a pit bull or something. And you make him mad because you're pulling on his ears. You got him, but how do you let go of him? You get into things that you have trouble getting out of. We need to, the Bible tells you to tell us to mind our own business. I have enough problems getting John, keeping John lined up with God to try to line you up with God. What he's saying to us, and I'm not saying don't be a responsible citizen or help somebody if you see them struggling. or what. I'm not saying that. Don't take it to an extreme. But at the same time, if we will be about Father's business, and what he's saying is if you'll worship and praise me, I will be able to work in a way in your life that I'll bring you forth into the fullness of what I have for you. I'll bring you forth in the fullness of what I have for you. Psalm 107, verse 8 says this. Oh, that men would... Well, let me go over here and read it. Uh, if I try to quote it, it'll come out like that other one did, which wasn't real great, was it? Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. This is a year of worship and praising God. This is a year for you to, when the enemy brings all this stuff in, and he's starting trying to get you into bitterness. He's starting to, you know, try to get you in all this political rancor that's going on in the earth. And, you know, I'm on this side and, I, and there are things that we see and we have our opinions. Some of our opinions are right. Some of our opinions we think are right and they're not. And other things we just don't even know, period. We don't have a clue. So don't play God. Let God be God. About a month ago, he told me, he kept telling me, go to, the, go to the church, go to the church, go to the church. It was Wednesday. I didn't want to go to the church. I wanted to stay home and rest. But I finally came to the church, and I sat down here in my chair, turned on some soft worship music, and just began to wait on the Lord. Okay, I'm here. I worship you. <laughs> and about 45 minutes into it, I finally got my brain slowed down enough I could hear it. And he said, I'm doing it. I'm like, oh, Okay. And so I'm waiting to hear him tell me what he's doing. He goes, I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. I'm doing it. He said that, about, I don't know how many times, 10, 15. Yeah. Finally, I realized he was doing it. <laughs> Not me. And I realized as I sat there, as that dawned on me what he was saying, John, don't get all uptight about this stuff. Don't, don't let the devil suck you into a place where strife and every evil work and all that stuff like we read in James is going to happen. He said, I'm doing this. My people have prayed, and I'm turning your nation around back to its godly foundation, and that is going to happen. I'm doing it. But you've got to worship, keep your eyes on me, and praise me. Otherwise, you'll be out here trying to do my part for me or let the devil deceive you into doing his part and use you as part of the problem. You, keep, you worship me all year long, and I'll be able to shift you and adjust you and put you in the right place, show you the things I need to show you as I do this on a worldwide scale to line up things for the kingdom age that's coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know about you, but that was good news to me. Anytime he's doing it and I don't have to, I like that part. Yes. Praise God. Did this help you this morning? Yes. Praise God. If it got on your toes, it's okay. The Holy Ghost will heal your toes. Yes. If he gets on our toes, we need to have him get on our toes. Yes. But I pray that you understand that God's works are graceful, merciful works. Yes. And he's working in that redemption. Let's pray. Father. Matter of fact, go, just stand with me. You've been sitting a long time. Just stand with me. And why don't you just do what we just read? Oh, that people would praise the Lord. 
for his goodness and for his wonderful works. Just praise him and thank him for what he's done for you. Praise him that you're saved. Praise him that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise him that he healed you. Praise him that you've got a future, hallelujah. You've got a hope and an expectation. Praise him that he's there with you and that he forgives all of our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness as we confess our sins. Just praise him for what he did at the cross. Hallelujah. It still stands. His works still stand and will stand for eternity. The atmosphere of heaven is worshiping and praising Jesus for what he's done. And as we do the same, the atmosphere of heaven comes to earth. And like Moses said in Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 11, 11, he said that it'll be like the days of heaven on earth. Hallelujah. As we magnify God, as we agree with heaven, as we live like they're living in heaven, as we worship and praise him, as we bring him in to everything in our lives, as we magnify him for who he is, what he said and what he's done. Glory to God. There's people in here that you're stressing over you haven't done enough. Let me tell you what he told me in the year 2000 when I went through a real hard time. He said, John, he asked me a question, do you do enough for me? I said, no. And he said, what is it you don't do enough of? And I went down my list of dead works that I didn't do enough of. I didn't know they were dead works, but they were. And after I was done, he said, son, he said, not only do you do enough for me, you're doing so much you're in my way. And I said, well, you're going to have to define that for me, what, what's enough. And what he told me, because of the way I was raised, because of the way we think in America and so forth, it sounded like laziness to me. But it wasn't. It was actually resting in faith. Because you see, the works have been finished from the foundation of the earth. You and I, you ever, you ever see dominoes when they stand them up on end? You know, you've seen that when people stand them up on end. Think about time that way. God's over here at the first domino when he created the heavens and the earth. He spoke into existence you and every, you're one of them dominoes down there. All the way down. Let's say you're the 500th domino. And he's over here and it is finished. Boop. And click, 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 click out through time. The will of God just starts playing out, out through time. Now, if you're 500 down there, and you're saying, you know, I've been waiting a long time for things to happen. For, maybe I better go over here and do this. Right. Yeah. Click, 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 yeah. click. Goes right on by you. That's, right. That's what he's telling us right here. But if you just stay put and worship him, magnify him, fellowship with him, let him tell you what to do and when to do it. Don't go out and try to build his kingdom for him. Let him lead you into the Let him build character in you so he can use you. Whatever process he's got you in right now, there's going to come a day when all of a sudden you're going to feel something hit you in the back of the head. You know, the back of your head is symbolic in the word for the prophetic word of the Lord. You'll hear a voice behind you say, this is the way, walk ye in it. All of a sudden one day you'll hear the voice of the Lord and you'll go into, like that dominant, you'll go into what God has for you. Oh, Glory. That's who we are. Father, I thank you and I praise you this morning. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and praise him. Thank him for his wondrous works. Thank him for what he's doing in your life. Thank him that you can walk with him and talk with him like Adam did before he sinned. Thank him that he is God and he loves you. I praise you, Lord. I thank you. Father, I pray over your people right now. I come against any kind of demonic interference. Now receive this prayer. Agree with me. Agree, just let's agree. The Bible says if two agree, if they harmonize, if they symphonize together, that God will answer. He'll do what he needs to do. I say in Jesus' name that all the demonic white noise, all the demonic interference, all of the buzzing loud lies of the devil, shut down right now in the name of Jesus. And God, I thank you that as your people find that quiet place, like Mary found, sitting at your feet ages ago as she was listening to you teach. She didn't know that you were preparing her to, to work with you to raise her brother from the dead. But God, I thank you that as your people find that place and they live in that place every day and they let you teach them, they let you give them that good part that will not be taken from them. In Jesus' name, that Father, they walk in the fullness of what you have for them because your works are true. 
what you've established when you created this earth, what you've established in Jesus Christ is forever. And we thank you for it. We receive it. Let every, if you're in here and you need healing in your body, lift your hand up, hold it up high and just hold it up, leave it up there. If you need healing in your body, lift your hand up and hold it up. Now, all of you that believe in laying on of hands, that know what the word says, that those that believe will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, look for somebody around you with their hand up. Lay your hand on their shoulder or on their back. Just lay hands on them. Let's just gang up on the devil this morning. Hallelujah. There's a couple of people in the back, back there, don't have hands laid on them. Somebody go over there. You can walk around and move around if you want to. Everybody got somebody laying hands on them? Hallelujah. Praise God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command disease to leave this room. I command infirmity to leave this room and leave the bodies of these people right now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. There's the anointing right there. Receive it. Receive the anointing. Receive the anointing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I command pain to go. I command back pain to leave. I command life to flow. I agree. All of us in this room, we agree that life is flowing. That healing is flowing. I command any spirit of infirmity that has attached itself to someone's body. You loose them and let them go in the name of Jesus. Let them go now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for creative miracles. I thank you for medical miracles. I thank you that there's someone in here that when they go back to the doctor, he's going to be amazed, just like he was amazed last week with our sister whose back was completely renewed. I thank you for that, Father. We thank you for it. We receive our inheritance. We receive the fullness of our redemption in Jesus' name. Now, lift up the other hand. Everybody else, lift your hands with him, and let's praise him and thank him for what he's done. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Now, I just heard this. God wants to put a miracle in your mouth. God wants to put a miracle in your mouth. He's going to have you, if you'll just walk with him, flow with him, what we're talking about. He's going to have you say some things to somebody by his spirit, and miracles are going to happen because you said it. I don't know if it'll be a healing miracle, maybe a financial miracle, maybe somebody getting free uh, you know, from something in their past or whatever. I don't know. But listen, align yourself with the Lord. Don't buy into the enemy in his attempt to bring you over into that place of strife and bitterness. I mean, attack that thing if it tries to get close to you. In Jesus' name. And then say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Bring me to those people you want me to talk to. And I will say to them what you put in my heart and in my mouth to say. And I'm believing that because I know when you speak, it's creative. When you speak through me, it's creative. When you spoke on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. And I thank you that as you speak through me, at school, at work, wherever it's at, miracles happen in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.